chief academic officers, they're my, they're my buddies. And we have been talking about this ever since I've been on board at the CPE and really was talked about before I came on board. So three years, the conversation has been heavily around how can we increase the likelihood that KCTCS fulfill the dreams as much as possible to an associate degree and then how can we increase that 20 small percent of our students from KCTCS going to our four-year institutions. And many of you at the four-year institutions, I spent a lot of time doing this at Eastern, my alma mater. Uh, the idea that if we, get, if we get a transfer student, we have a great likelihood that they're going to graduate and graduate in time. So this matters. This is not just an entrepreneurial model. This is an expediency model. So what are the strategies that, that's listed in our strategic agenda that we're asking you to operationalize at a very localized level to your institution? We want to maximize KCTCS's role. We know that with a higher cost of, of public education in this state and around the nation, we're going to have to create a process whereby that we're helping our students get the strongest baseline in that first and second year is super important the strongest baseline, and we need to do it at the lowest cost possible. Now, that means that it's our goal to work with KCTCS institutions to build their capacity, not just numerically, but qualitatively. And it's important that we look at that to such a degree because of the amount of public education dollars that's flowing in the state. We know tuition matters now more than it did 10 years ago. And so how can, as much as possible, we maximize the tuition input? Provide student and institutional incentives to increase degree in, uh, completion. We know that there's now much more high-touch need that should be there versus possibly 20 years ago. And you'll hear many of our speakers talk about that. How can we do that at a level that makes sense? How can we actually uh, put together a, a strong, holistic process with our curricular and co-curricular. You know, how can we break down the idea uh, that we have on many of our campuses that academic affairs is over here and student affairs is over there and that neither the twain shall meet? I mean, we're going to have to talk a different language, and many of you are, so I thank you for that. Many of you also have one of the other primary elements of student success in place. You're increasing your opportunities for appreciative advising at the faculty and at the professional level. The increased use of data and research to improve learning outcomes. We are very stuck on, and you hear a little bit about it tomorrow, we're stuck on not just using data, but using analytics that will point us in directions that can help us to use our resources more wisely in areas that we need to use those resources in. You know, analytics, and we've done a lot here lately on leading indicators like retention. What can analytics tell us? And at the state level, we can give you s some data and some analytics, but you can go to your own campuses, all of you IR people in the room and IE people, you know what I'm talking about. You can dig deeper and see exactly at a very micro level what you can do to have input for your students no matter where they're coming from. We also want to promote uh, new degree pathways for our adult learners. We have a significant number in this state, around 500 plus thousand, that have touched us at some level in post-secondary that we need to go and get. This is the low-hanging fruit. But we're going to have to figure out how we can market, brand, and provide the kind of necessary resources for this population. Secure adequate funding and support for faculty, staff, and other resources that enhance student success. And in a few minutes, I'll talk a little bit about this more in depth, but we know faculty matter, folks. We know good faculty matter more. We know faculty engagement in and out of the classroom may matter the most. How can we increase this likelihood that they are going to be there? How can we increase the likelihood that we're going to have the right faculty to make it happen? I know Bob King and, and uh, our, our, our group uh, here at the CPE, we're anxious to do all that we can do to work with you and our legislature to try to get money to make sure that we have that kind of resource in place. 
improve the quality of student experience. Uh, in a few minutes, our guest speaker, the well-known Dr. Koo, will talk a little bit about engagement. But we know student experiences matter. And how does it matter? When we look in our surveys later on, a student that's happy with the college experience will talk to you about the diverse experiences they had on the campus, about the inputs they had from a mentor, the inputs they had from a faculty member, from an advisor. They will talk in very great detail about how that helped them to maneuver what they needed to do, not only in college, but even once they graduated from college. And then we want to talk about implementing the statewide diversity policy. And many of you have already put in place a diversity plan. This diversity plan isn't designed to be stagnant. It's, the, it's designed to be very dynamic. So how can we use formative understanding in order to increase the likelihood that we're getting better and not just achieving a minimal score? The idea that diversity, as you all know, the first year, and you'll hear about that from Dr. Cusio and a lot of other folks here, the first year is the greatest opportunity for a student to ever experience diversity in their lives. Have we operationalized in our curriculum, in our co-curriculum, a process whereby we turn this into a competence? We can measure competency. It's kind of hard to measure what diversity is. We can take this into doing what exactly we know how to do best, and that's create student learning outcomes and, and a measurement to see if we've accomplished those outcomes. How do we take advantage of the diversity of thought, the diversity of people on our campus to help our other students learn from it? You'll hear a lot about that while you're here. But the item I want to talk to you about the most it's kind of where we're at in Kentucky and, and where we're at, I think, nationally around the subject matter of student success. So what do we know? We know that if you basically help a student do two things, they will be successful. Now, there's a lot of strategies and a lot of inputs and outputs you have to measure to make sure that we do that. One is if you help a student to self-actualize, to know where he or she may be at that point in time, that they don't have what they need to be successful, whatever goal they set for themselves. Now, we know some of the strategies there. We have to be able to help them know how to set goals. We have to be able to help them to know when they are not on the path of reaching those goals. So success is more than just the idea of setting a goal and accomplishing it. As Dr. King said, and many of us know, it's also a quality input. It's about excellence. It's about what we put into it, the right strategies, showing up for class and being engaged in class. It's about faculty, staff input. So we have to be able to help our students to understand and be able to self-monitor and self-evaluate and self-actualize. How can we make them a part of it? That's number one. Number two is how do we help them to be innovative enough to always find that item that they need? And it's not just telling them where it's at. We still have this habit, I think, uh, I've done a lot in first year programs and so on. We have a habit in having them go to the library and have someone show them different spaces and different places. We have to help them to know how to search out what they need based on based on their actualization of their deficit. That's important, and you've heard this before, that if you provide a mass with fish, they can eat one time. But if you teach them how to fish, they can eat how often? For a lifetime. That's our job in higher education, is to be able to provide them with knowledge and input that not only can they maneuver their college experience with success, but they can actually take that message and take that knowledge and move it into the world after college. And it's been said already, but I just want to tell you that employers are telling us what. The people that employ our students, they're telling us what. We want them to be able to do more higher order thinking, critical thinking, problem solving, right? They say this is a deficit that we have. We want them to be able to have knowledge about how to work with diverse people on the ground, have global understanding. We want them to be able to orally and written 
community, it, we, we need to increase what we do to give them the competency and communication orally and as they write. So writing matters. Have we incorporated that across our institutions? Liberal arts and general education matters, people. It matters a lot. And you're, some of you already know, well, you're trying to decrease general education on our campus. No, we're trying to make it lean and mean and matter. And general education and liberal arts, as they are employed even in our professional courses, matter. Increasing the writing requirements, the speaking requirements. This also helps the student to be more engaged. So our agenda goes from college readiness to college completion. When students come to you, we know in many ways they have similarities. Many, whether fair or not, been thought I'm being taught to think in very basic patterns. And some of you who are faculty know this, that when they come to your classroom and you have a review for the test and you give them an opportunity to ask you deep questions about the test, what do they ask you? What's going to be on the test? You know, is it going to be multiple choice or true and false? We've got to help our students ask the right questions. We've got to be able to help them to understand that it's going to take higher order thinking and higher order maneuvering and higher order output in their communication skills, as an example, to be successful, not only while they're in college, but while uh, they go to their employee, I mean, their employed world. So you hear a lot about that. You hear a lot about closing the gaps. We are still leaving people behind in our K-12. We've got to help them catch up. College readiness is more than just whether or not they come to us prepared. It's that they come to us and ready to perform. And we have committed ourselves to be partners with K-12 to make sure that that happens. So what are the four big pillars that we know that we're going to have to sooner or later emulate in higher education, that we know that mattered up to the point they come to us, whether they are adult learners or if they are traditional age population groups. We know the first one is family. We know the importance of whether there's a one parent or two parent person in the household. But we also know the reality that we have many of our students that may not have a parent in that household. So the input of family matter. And that's one of the big pillars. You know the formation process. You know the developmental process, zero to five. We know the expectations. We know the physical protection, the emotional input. We know all of that. It matters. So what are we doing in our higher education process to know who those students are, and I'll get to that in a second. So family matter. And some of you heard me tell this before. My father was an illiterate coal miner from southeastern Kentucky. Clay County. Any Clay Countyans here, by the way? Oh, good. I'm glad I'm representing. <laughs> you know, mother had an eighth grade education. She said, boy, you need to get an education because education will help you to have income. My father basically said, who was a coal miner, boy, you get an education, you won't have to break your back in the coal mines. Now, I interpreted that as, okay, son, get a college degree and then another degree and then another degree and another degree. Uh, but basically what he was saying was that, that education gives you options. So take advantage of the knowledge that it gives you. Families matter. Some families don't tell their kids that. And so it's just more than whether or not a family member went to college beforehand, even though we know that matters. It matters whether or not the encouragement is there. We know when we look at many of our dropouts and we go deep, and when they tell us all the truth about why they dropped out, if it wasn't for academic reasons, which only accounts in Kentucky about 20% of the reason, by the way. When we look at it deeply, they tell us really interesting stories about their families. And in many cases, we know they have to help them you know, and financially. But in many ways, it's also the social and emotional support that's so important. So we need to think about that. The second one is the community. We know that depends on what community, quote unquote, a kid comes from, whether or not he or she will have the best opportunity possible to maneuver higher education. 
or even K-12. The idea that, in fact, if you're from a community that higher education or even K-12 education isn't the most important thing they need to consider, whether it's a community that is riddled with crime or if it's a community that doesn't have the culture of education, we know community matters. And the most important piece of that community that seems to matter more would be your peers. And we know this already, that by age 11 or 12, peers play as important of a role or maybe more important of a role than a parent or a teacher. So how are we incorporating peers into the process? The example that I give, that I didn't have anyone that had gone to high school before me, well, my brother had, but he was six years older than me, so he wasn't around, so I, I didn't know how to maneuver high school. So what I did was I picked the five smartest kids in high school, and I did whatever they did. Whatever classes they took, whatever organizations they belonged to, I was, I was gonna do exactly the same thing. We call that stalking now, so you can't do it, but <laughs> back then it was forced mentoring. <laughs> We've got to be able to understand peers matter. How are we incorporating peers into our success agenda? Are we formally doing that? We know mentoring matters, people. Professional level and peer level, it's huge. Corporations and many successful organizations have had this in place for how long? Higher education, we need, if we don't have a formal process for that, let's think about it, peer advising, and so on. So community is the second pillar to that success story. The third pillar would be the institution itself. Not all K-12 institutions are the same. If you get a, if you're a valedictorian at one K-12 institution, it may not be the same as a valedictorian from another K-12 institution. That's just the truth. It matters, it matters what curriculum they offer, it matters to what degree they expect students to succeed, it matters to the rigor, it matters to all of that, we know that. And we know that the more disenfranchised you are in many of our K-12 institutions, the less likely you're gonna be expected to perform. So teachers matter in that regard. One of the biggest things that we know about closing the gap is that we have high rigor, high expectations, and high input from professionals within that organization. We have evidence over and over again that if we have that, students will succeed at a higher level than even their majority counterparts. We know that. How are we operationalizing at your institution the right curriculum, the right holistic process with, between all of the inputs that students have. Do we have high expectations from all of our students? I tell all of my students when I was teaching, and, and I know you can't do this, but I, I did and got by with it. I'm surprised I hadn't been fired. You know, students come in the first day and I ask them a simple question. I ask them to give me the definition, first day, between stupidity and ignorance. And they look at me and don't say anything for a minute. So someone will speak up and say, well, that ignorance is you don't know. And you don't know you don't know. I said, that's correct. But so let me give you an operational definition of stupidity in my class. Is that if you have an opportunity to learn and you don't take advantage of it, then you're stupid. And I want you to think about that every time. Then when you come in and you lay your head on my desk, what are you being? And I make them answer. When you come in late, 15 minutes late, or when you don't show up for class and don't tell me why, what are you being? Or when you're in trouble and you know you're in trouble and you don't come and see me, what are you being? I want the student to be engaged with his or her learning. And that's important, so that goes to number four, and that's the student, him or herself. How are we helping them to have skin in the game? The more a student is engaged, and we'll talk about that, right? The more a student is engaged in his or her learning, the greater opportunity they will have of being successful. And let me make clear what I'm talking about success. I am talking about completing, but I'm also talking about satisfaction with college and satisfaction with life. I'm also talking about the qualitative elements of learning. The importance that we help students to have skin in the game should be what we're all about also. When I used to assign work in my class, 
I would have a student go to a co-curricular activity, a speaker, or whatever the case may be, and I would always give them points. Not extra credit points, that would be a part of my class. I would give them points, but they just couldn't get the points by going. They had to write me a page of critical analysis of what they learned. I kill a lot of birds with that stone. There's no reason why we can't work together to have students engaged at a high level. I love Kentucky. Let me end my conversation with this. I love Kentucky, and I love what we're doing in Kentucky. And we've had a lot of great success since, since 2000. We're number one in many categories of completion and so on as far as improvement. But that only gives us a formative measurement about how much farther we need to go. It doesn't tell us that that's where we stop. And when I see 300 people at our inaugural process, and I call it a process because this is not going to end here. We're going to be engaged with you if you let us as we move forward out of here. That this makes me feel good that I'm a part of the solution. And that somehow it's more than just telling you what I can't do, but I'm seeing you here and you're telling me what we can do. And that makes me happy. So thank you for showing up and thank you for being here. We're going to move along fairly fast because we know we're going to stay on time so we can have this, uh, uh, give everybody a chance to speak, but also have a time for us to watch this ball game. <laughs> Does it sound like I have an agenda? No. By the way, if anybody want to come with me tonight and watch the ball game, don't come unless you're bringing me something that I would enjoy with you, okay? Just to let you know. <laughs> We are happy to have uh, the folks with us that's going to, and, and I'm going to kind of put them in a spot that we've talked about, but they're willing to do it. We, we've got some nationally, internationally known folks here that know a lot about not only strategies, but real life solutions and able to talk with us about how also to measure to make sure that we're putting them in place. So I would love if you would take advantage of them on breaks and other time to just ask them specific questions about, uh, about your particular programs. We're also, uh, we're going to have some round tables where we would have an opportunity to talk with you more in depth about items. And so come to the table ready to ask questions. We're also in a situation whereby this year we asked for a few posters. And we did get a few posters, and this is a great way to start the conference or the summit to think about what we're doing on our campus. So you'll see some examples of that all day long today and tomorrow. But next year, we're hoping to start early enough to where you get a chance to talk about what your institution is doing with high best practices and success to talk with us. So prepare yourself for that, and we will set up a review process whereby for you faculty and other people that care about this tenure and promotion stuff, we'll set it up in such a way that you'll get credit for it. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. George Koo.